Hello students, this is our Psych 100 lecture for the psychodynamic perspective. Um, this video lecture will go along with chapter 10, uh, the psychodynamic perspective as part of personality psychology uh, this week's topic. So um, since we have a snow day, I want you to go into Blackboard, download the uh, lecture slides for this week's lecture, and then look through the slides as I go through this video. You'll be uh, encouraged to pause periodically and put together a, an assignment um, about a fictional character that you are going to psychoanalyze this week, and you will then turn in this assignment on Blackboard via our discussion boards uh, sometime before our next class, which is in two weeks right after spring break. Uh, and so let's go. Uh, before we get started, I do want to hearken back to our uh, homework. I asked you to do a dream interpretation, um, and the idea being that psychodynamic theory posits that what's going on in our unconscious mind greatly influences our thoughts and our emotions, and basically we lie to ourselves, often without even knowing. We have no idea the extent to which we are denying uh, things and repressing things and um, all sorts and this is these are ego defenses they're meant to protect ourselves um, but what happens is that we don't know the true cause of our thoughts and our emotions so our dreams the idea is that our dreams might be a gateway into these unconscious experiences and therefore in order to understand better our thoughts and our emotions we can look at our dreams now keep in mind for this assignment I want you to take this to ridiculous lengths yeah so it's it's more fun to do it that way. We do have crazy dreams sometimes, possibly all the time, that mean absolutely nothing, uh, but I want you to pretend like they do, right? And same thing as we're going through this assignment today within this lecture, I want you to pretend that there is perfect meaning behind everything that we are discussing. Uh, so um, you are going to use vocabulary and theories and all of that, just like you did for the dream interpretation assignment. I did want to give you an example of my dream because I told you last week that I would, and now it's going to be on YouTube. Yay! Um, so here's my example. Uh, I actually had this dream last year, uh, right before I was doing this uh, project with the Psych 100 students, so I recorded it for posterity, and here we go. I had a dream that I was getting married to Dan Aykroyd in my elementary school cafeteria. Uh, he was in his Ghostbusters uniform. My sister, uh, my older sister, was also getting married. She was getting married to Jack Nicholson on the same day in a double wedding. And we were all going to buy a house together, but then my sister and I decided that the house was too expensive, and so we were like, no, sorry guys, we're not going to buy this house. And Dan and, and Jack, our fiancés, were really pissed off that we had just decided to cancel buying this house without telling them, and um, asked if we still even wanted to get married. Uh, my sister and I were like, yeah, and so we called off the wedding. Weddings. Uh, so applying this back, remember in uh, this project, everything is of perfect importance and highly relevant, etc. Uh, so according to psychic causality, uh, none of this is random, and therefore all of it is highly meaningful. And this was happening in my elementary school cafeteria because of the critical importance of early experiences, which is also why I was getting married to a Ghostbuster, because for the same reason I saw the movies when I was a kid um, and with my sister. And then going into the, the weddings, so my sister and I said that we didn't want to get married um, because it was too expensive, uh, the house, but actually that was likely an ego defense, and really we were threatened in some way, didn't want to experience for many reasons, I'm sure, uh, getting married and becoming Mrs. Aykroyd and Mrs. Nicholson. Uh, we were in denial about the importance of calling off the weddings and what it meant to them, what it meant to all of us, by just saying, eh, acting like it was no big deal. And we were rationalizing our distaste for marrying these guys by saying that the house was too expensive when really we just didn't want to get married. So um, I started going to that school cafeteria during my edible stage, five to six years old. And so either I am very competitive with my sister or I view Dan Aykroyd as a father figure. 
so yeah, that's kind of what we're going to be doing today, except I want you to be able to uh, put all of these things together um, with the uh, theories, with the assumptions and models and terminology that we're going to, to cover. So if you have the PowerPoint slide open, um, you will see an update. This is a word cloud on the second slide of all of our um, I guess descriptions from the ink blot from from the quiz last week. I just wanted to update with this. These are words. I typed in every single word you guys wrote, and these were the most common ones. Uh, you'll remember from when we were talking about uh, Gestalt theory uh, way back when. Humans are really, really good at recognizing patterns, and face patterns also is one of the first patterns that we recognize in infancy, and it continues on throughout our lives that we're really good at recognizing faces. So it's not surprising to me to see so many different descriptions of faces that came up. All right, so uh, moving forward onto the fourth slide, it says pick a character, any character. Uh, take a minute to pick a television show, movie, book, etc. character. Um, it doesn't matter who you pick. It doesn't have to be the same character that you picked for last week, but it does have to be a character that you know well. Um, and I'm going to once again reiterate, you can use a famous person so long as you do not personally know this famous person, because in our modern society, famous people we kind of treat them like fictional characters anyway. We follow the stories of their lives. Um, so this can be a famous person there, or it can be a fictional character, but someone that you know a lot about them. So uh, you're going to spend this entire activity psychoanalyzing them. So seriously, pick someone you know well. Um, and rather than in your small groups, because you are by yourself probably, um, I want you to actually write up a description for each of the slides. So you'll have six total uh, things um, that you will write up about your character. And we'll have a chance to pause at each point so that you can write down some notes about your character. You will then put all of this into a discussion board post. There will be a link to that in the announcement page so that you can uh, put your assignment into this. Uh, you'll also be able to read each other's posts, keep that in mind, but you can only read other people's posts after you have entered your own post. So um, you won't be able to just copy paste from other folks, but uh, kind of put in your own thoughts from this. So next slide, the assumptions of psychoanalytics. There are three primary assumptions that we use within this field. Uh, the first is the primacy of the unconscious. We've talked about this a bit before, this idea that what is going on in our minds we're not always fully aware of. There's only so much that we can put our attention to, and what we are tending to, what we are thinking about actively, oftentimes we think that's all there is that's going on, but that's not the case. There's a lot of other things going on in our brains at all times that we're just not paying that much attention to. Although we're not paying that much attention to them, they still have very strong influences on our thoughts and our motivations and our behaviors and um, our emotions and all of these things. And so oftentimes we wind up thinking, why did I just do that? Why am I saying this? Oh my God, that was such a boneheaded thing or whatever else. Um, but the thing is, there were reasons, there were motivations. We just weren't fully aware of them. Uh, number two is the critical importance of early experiences. So again, we develop our worldviews and our sense of what is normal and what is right, our expectations for reality, for how people should behave, how we should interact with others, um, what is normal. We develop this in our early childhood. So usually by about six or seven, we've kind of figured out how we think the world is supposed to work. And so therefore, or uh, we expect certain things that we experienced uh, when we were kids. Um, we expect people to treat us like we were treated then. We expect the world to work more or less that way. Uh, we may bother to try to change our worldview and our outlook, but most times we don't bother and we don't even notice that there's anything different between our outlook and the outlook and the rest of others in the world. Uh, assumption number three is psychic causality. Nothing 
nothing we do, say, think, want, dream, fantasize about is random. We often say, oh, that was so random. I don't know why this popped in my head, but there was a meaning. There was some link to something that we saw or experienced or thought. It connected back to this other random thing so that it's not actually random at all. We just don't consciously understand what that link was. And so again, by trying to find those links, uh, that's where we can get to uh, health and wholeness and wellness, etc. Um, so think about these uh, three primary assumptions as they relate to your character. And again, if you can't um, tell from the story why that is true, I want you to make up some reasons. It doesn't have to be serious, but it does have to be accurate. Um, so apply these assumptions to your character, pause and go. All right, the next slide is the topographical model, and that's dealing with the conscious, pre-conscious, and unconscious. The conscious, again, that's what we're thinking about right now. It is what we are tending to, what we are actively uh, trying to create with our minds, within our cognition. Our pre-conscious is everything that could possibly be in our mind, but just isn't right now. It's uh, basically in a waiting stage for us to bother to think about it, right? Um, so this is not the same as the unconscious. The unconscious are things that are going on uh, in our mind, but that we are either actively repressing, we don't want to think about them for various reasons, and we'll come back to that later, or um, thinking about it actively would make us anxious, or um, we just don't realize for one reason or another that this is going on in our mind and that these motivations are kind of pulling into our thoughts. So uh, some of the examples, and again, we'll get back into this later uh, with our ego defenses, but some of the examples of why certain things might be unconscious, why we might push them away from our conscious thoughts. Say I have $100 right here in my hand. I'm going to give away $100 to one of you. One of my lucky students, I'm going to give you $100. So right now, in your conscious mind, you're probably thinking, oh, yay, $100. I want $100. I want $100. Yeah, so this is something that's in our heads. We, it is in our conscious. We're thinking about it. And maybe in our pre-conscious would be all of our possible plans that we might have for $100, and we might be pulling some of these things from our pre-conscious into our conscious thinking, oh, I could do this, and I could buy that, and I could experience this, and etc. And so these are all the things that we're thinking about. But um, it turns out I just changed my mind, and I'm not going to give any of you $100. Instead, I am going to give $100 to this homeless lady I know. She hasn't eaten food in a while, and she needs some new shoes. And so I'm going to give her the $100 instead of giving any of you $100. In your conscious mind right now, you're probably thinking, darn, I wanted $100, but it makes sense. She needs it more than me, and of course she should have it, and that was a good decision, and etc., etc. And so we're thinking all of these things consciously, but in your unconscious, there is some part of you that is like, damn it, I wanted that $100. I deserve it more than her. Um, and you don't want to know this about yourself. You don't want to think to yourself that you would take food and shoes away from somebody who needs food and shoes just because you want to go out to a fancy dinner or buy a new stereo. I guess we don't have stereos anymore, but you know what I mean. Um, we don't want to think to ourselves that we have wants and desires that are counter to what we should want, what we should desire. But we do. We're human animals. Humans are flawed. We are imperfect. We are animals. We have base instincts and drives. And these things push us toward wanting things and doing things and having emotions and thoughts that we don't want to have, but we have them anyway. And since we don't want this to be reality, we don't want this to be part of who we are, we push all of that down into our unconscious, but it stays there and it still affects our motivations and our behaviors. And again, we'll come back to this again. So uh, pause the video, write down some notes. How, does, how do each of these, the conscious, pre-conscious, and unconscious, uh, relate to your character? 
Next we have our psychosexual stage model. Uh, this is the fun stuff. This is Freud, yeah? So um, there has been a lot of argument against Freud over the last, what, 150 years, um, which makes sense. You know, uh, he, he is a product of his time, um, and he created some theories that are honestly still in use today, although the interpretations and the implications have changed an awful lot. Uh, and so we still use these theories, but um, we don't use them in exactly the same way in some cases, or we, some theorists don't even put as much emphasis on it as others. Uh, but a lot of what we know and what we theorize in psychology was built on this, which is why it's still taught today. The psychosexual stage model uh, in our current interpretation is not that, hey, when we're infants, we want to have sex with everybody. That's not what it means. But what it does mean is that as adults, um, we are sexual beings. We, there's, there's sexual urges and thoughts, and it's part of our human instincts and drives, and it's just there for most people. Um, what's also true, and what Freud was particularly fascinated in, is that we're really weird about sex. Like, people have hang-ups, they want, you you know, to date people or marry people that are really bad for them. Um, they kind of have these competing urges and drives and, and things that don't make sense within our conscious mind, and we develop hang-ups about that. Freud was very interested in these hang-ups, and because of the primacy of, or the, uh, the critical importance of early experiences, he started looking at childhood, and as we're developing each of these systems in our mind, within our body, within our social interactions, thinking, okay, well, if um, in early childhood we're dealing and learning about all of these things, what if we are taught shame? Or what if something bad happens during these early experiences? And then that keeps coming up later when we're adults and fully sexual beings. What if the hangups that we have as adults, the neuroses and weirdness and everything else, what if that actually started in childhood? And so that's where the psychosexual stage model comes from and how it's used. Uh, we can also see that uh, within these stages, um, they're accurate, they're descriptive. Uh, for example, the oral phase, 0 to 18 months-ish, um, babies put things in their mouths. If they can grab it, it's going in their mouth. It just is. Um, and that's an accurate description. But their mouths are kind of how babies explore the world, how things taste, how they feel, their texture, their hardness, their shape, and all of these things. Um, babies explore the world through their mouths. It's true and accurate. Uh, anal phase. Uh, potty training anyone, that can be a huge disaster for some kids. It's uh, difficult. It's scary. They have to learn how to control their physical functions, and then when they don't, especially when they're in public or sitting on the couch, people get angry. Plus, there's this scary toilet monster that makes huge noise, and it's it, it can be difficult. Some kids uh, during this stage um, realize that they have control over this part of their lives, yeah? And um, what they do is... Um, they don't want to go potty to the potty because the potty's scary and whatever other reasons. Um, but they also don't want to be wearing diapers. So what they do is they just hold it in. They hold it in as much as they possibly can. And so they're kind of learning this control, this, this um, obsessive need to maintain um, control over their body and power over their lives. Uh, the phrase or the, the description of someone as anal, meaning that they are very fastidious and want everything to be exactly as they, they are. Um, in Freud's theory, this comes from having an anal fixation, so getting fixated or getting caught in this stage. Something went wrong, they needed to have control and power over their lives because it was just too crazy and upsetting um, within this stage, and so yeah, that's where that term comes from. Um, also, you'll notice that kids this age really fascinated by poop. So there you go. Uh, Oedipal stage. This can be like four, five, six, seven years old, somewhere in this time frame. And kids are learning gender norms at this point. They're learning the difference between being a boy and being a girl in our society, both in terms of rules and the way that they're supposed to behave, um, but also in terms of their physical bodies. Um, 
So two things that are very important within this stage is number one, uh, Freud noticed that boys and girls are very interested in their genitalia at this point and figuring out that difference between boys and girls. And again, this is accurate. Kids this age are just obsessed with boy parts and girls parts, and they want to learn about how their anatomy works and all of these things. And if you're around four or five, six year olds, they always got their hands down their pants. They just do. Um, one of my uh, friends, when she was in daycare, came home and they had um, drawn underwear and marker um, on each other, like the kids had gotten away from the adults and had taken off their pants and drawn on underwear. And it's just, they, they do weird things, they're obsessed with it. Um, so yes, that's accurate. Uh, Freud was a man in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and uh, one of his things that he uh, thought to be true was that this is about the age when girls realize that they do not have a penis. And they're like, that's wrong. I want that. And so then they start having penis envy, which, yep, that was the term. They, they want to have a penis. Um, so more modern theorists recognize that actually it's not the actual physical body part that girls are after, but it's the social standing and the social rules. So for example, I was about that age. It was a hot summer um, when I was at a daycare where my mom used to work and there were kids kind of broken up into different age groups and I would have been about four or five. My little sister, who's a couple years younger than me, would have been in the toddler group, and it was a hot day. We are playing, and all of the boys got to take their shirts off. Um, in my little sister's group, everyone got to take their shirts off. In my group, the girls had to keep their shirts on. Um, we're four and five, like there's really no physical difference in the torsos between four and five year old girls and boys, uh, but there was a social restriction. And I recognized at that point, this is different. This is different from the way that the boys are getting to live their lives. And I was jealous. I wanted to take my shirt off. It was hot. Um, but I recognized that they had a social standing that we did not have. Uh, also what happens at this stage, since uh, kids are learning about gender roles, they're also learning about love and marriage and relationships and mommy and daddy and all these sorts of things. Um, and they pattern these uh, scripts, these gender scripts, off of the, the people that they see around them, typically their parents or primary caregivers, etc, etc. And what commonly happens, not always, but is not uncommon, is that uh, boys begin to relate to their father, but also feel a little bit competitive with their father because I want to be like you, but I also want to be better than you. Same girls start to relate to their mother, but they feel a little competitive to their mother because I want to be like you, but also kind of better than you. Um, but then they also start thinking, okay, when I grow up and get married, um, who is it that I'm going to get married? I want to get married to someone who is like the opposite gender, if that's the way that they swing. And so they start thinking about that in terms of love and romance. Um, kids at this age, hopefully, usually, they don't understand what is fully involved in love and marriage and all of these things. And so their translation of all of this is not, oh, I want to marry someone like daddy, or I want to marry someone like mommy, but instead I want to marry daddy, or I want to marry mommy, because these are people that they love and they recognize that that is who, the type of person they're modeling who they would want to get married to. Uh, this does happen. Um, maybe you've seen it with kids in your own life. Uh, my favorite story is my cousin Megan. Uh, her daughter Liv uh, came to her one day and she's like, oh mommy, I wonder who I'm gonna get married to when I grow up. And Megan was like, oh well, I'm sure he's out there. And Liv said, I hope it's daddy. And Megan said, but I'm married to daddy. And Liv screamed, but I love him! And um, yeah, that happens. It just does. Kids do that. She doesn't know and she'll grow out of that when her brain is further developed and whatnot. But this is all learning about gender roles at this, at this stage. Latency, six years to about puberty. The best way that I can understand this is that Freud couldn't figure out what was going on that related to psychosexual health as grown-ups, so he just called it latency. Nothing happens. Uh, kids are learning about themselves and what they can do in the world. And then puberty starts, and it's all about the sex thereafter. Um, and the entire rest of their lives is kind of focused on that. Uh, so, hooray! Welcome! Um, 
So take a uh, pause the video, write down some notes about how each of these stages relates to your character, and um, yeah, I'll wait. We are going to blow right past intermission and move into the structural model. This is also one of the one of the Freudian theories um, that has to do with the nature of ourself and kind of that divided sense of self that we have, particularly with our unconscious. So the id. Um, Human beings are animals. Yeah, we're primates. We evolved uh, through a system and we have base drives and instincts. There are certain things that we need in order to survive and there are certain things that we want because it is pleasurable for us to have them. Um, so for example, uh, I need to have food to survive, but some food tastes better than other food, right? And so that animal instinct within me is like, I must eat cake and I see a cake and I want the cake and I'm ready to like push everybody out of the way in order to eat the cake and that's the id that's the id saying hey katie cake is amazing totally go eat the cake yeah yeah that's my animal talking the super ego is kind of like the opposite of that it's that higher level brain functioning that we have it's our moral compass it's our conscience it's the geppetto talking and saying hey we are better than this we are better than animals we can repress and deny we can uh, do the best thing even if it goes absolutely against what we actually want in life we can make the world a better place we can make ourselves better we can transcend all of this um, and our super ego says no um, don't push the tiny little child away from his birthday cake and eat all of his cake in front of him. My id is saying, I don't care whose birthday it is, I want the cake, but the super ego is like, no, no, let's not ruin this kid's party and possibly life, um, you know, eating their cake and whatnot. Yeah, so our super ego is the one who is trying to make us be a good person, right? Our ego, that's our conscious self. This is who we think we are. This is what we do in life. This is all of this stuff that we think of as me and I. Um, and as we move through the day, all of our thoughts and our decisions, but the ego is trying to balance this interior war that sometimes we are entirely unconscious of, although sometimes we're conscious of it, yeah? So we have the id and all of the craving and all the desires and all of the irrational wants and animal drives. And then we have the super ego with all this transcendent, conscious, moral reasoning. And sometimes they can agree with each other. Sometimes they're going entirely different directions from each other. And our ego has to make decisions. And so our ego is thinking, ah, yes, I want the cake. And no, I shouldn't ruin this child's birthday party. So, ah, uh, uh, I'm going to make a decision and I am going to wait my turn and then eat cake. And the ego gets to make that decision, yeah? Um, gets to have the cake, gets to not ruin children's lives, everything is happy. It doesn't always work that simply. Sometimes we, the id kind of wins and we do things that even if we know better, and sometimes the superego wins, um, even when we should. Uh, let ourselves experience some pleasure and, and uh, enjoyment in life, but our superego super is saying, no, 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 we're going to transcend all of this. Um, and so it's, again, it's a constant struggle and it's a constant balance. So uh, with the structural model, apply it to your character. And now we move on to ego defenses. So we have a couple of slides with this one. Uh, ego defenses, they are interior processes that are acted out in our brain, oftentimes without us even knowing that these things are happening. Um, they happen automatically, they happen unconsciously, and they're protecting our ego. Again, I don't want to think of myself as the type of person that would kick a little child out of the way so that I could eat cake. Yeah? Part of me wants to do that because I want that cake, um, but I don't want to know that about myself, right? Um, and so to defend my ego, my conscious self, I'm going to have to pretend like that part of me doesn't exist. And that's basically what an ego defense is. It's all this pretending that the bad stuff isn't really there, that I have somehow overcome all of it. Even, it's, even if it's there and even if I can work past it, um, I don't even want to know that it's there. 
Ego defenses operate on the unconscious. They influence our behaviors, our thoughts, our emotions, and most of the time we don't even know that these things are happening. We can sometimes see them in other people and we can look back on ourselves and see them operating in hindsight sometimes. And every now and again, we get to have some insight into ourselves where we recognize this is what I am doing right now. Um, but usually we're not that aware of it. And this is why, going back to the psychodynamic theories and the uh, uh, the assumption of psychic causality, um, these random thoughts, these urges, these desires, that stupid thing that I did, why did I do that? Why am I saying this out loud? All of these things that seem so irrational to us are rational. They're connected to these wants and desires and thoughts and feelings and id desires and whatnot but we just aren't aware of it. And so if we can parse through um, and get away from recognizing or thinking that things are random and instead recognizing, okay, what is this really? That's when we can start to balance ourselves out and heal and grow. And so that would be kind of the point of the psychodynamic therapies and talk therapies and all of these things is to figure out what are our true motives and drives and etc. And sometimes that means that we have to start recognizing our ego defenses. So moving down to the next slide, I'm going to go over each of these six uh, ego defenses. I'm going to want you in your assignment to focus on three of them, uh, any three, it doesn't matter which, but I'm going to go through them one by one. So first we have our uh, repression. This is when we are moving upsetting information um, from the consciousness to the unconsciousness. Uh, so for example, I want that cake and I'm willing to kick a child out of the way in order to eat it. Maybe I won't really do it, but I'm kind of willing. There's some part of my brain that is like, yeah, anything for the cake. I'm going to repress that, right, because I don't want to know this about myself. Uh, denial is not the same. We often, in, in the real world, we use denial to mean like I'm pretending this thing doesn't exist. But what it means in, in psychology is that we are failing to appreciate the negative implications of it, right? Um, so we start thinking about how things are really not as important as we make it out to be. Let's say I did actually act on that and I kicked the child out of the way. It probably doesn't even bother him anyway. He didn't want cake. This kid doesn't even like cake. So this will be denial. So I'm failing to recognize the seriousness of it. Um, this is also, I'm gonna skip down, very similar to rationalization. A lot of these are very similar to each other, so just be aware of that. Uh, rationalization would be making excuses for engaging in unacceptable acts. So for example, I kick the child out of the way and I'm like, yeah, he would have done the same thing. And you're like, no, no, I wouldn't have. People don't kick children out of the way in order to eat cake. And I'm like, yeah, you say that, but you would totally have kicked that child out of the way. I'm rationalizing my behavior, right? So denial would be maybe saying that uh, this is not as important as everybody says that it is, and as honestly, truth be told, as I think that it is. Um, rationalization would be making excuses, yeah? But you can see how they might overlap. Uh, going back up to reaction formation, um, expressing outwardly the exact opposite of uh, what we are endlessly or, uh, feeling interiorly. So um, I'm fine. Everything's fine. I feel great. Yeah, my entire world's falling apart. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I lost all my money and I just got kicked out of my house. And yeah, all of my friends hate me. But you know what? I'm really good. I'm, I'm in a good me place. Uh, that would be reaction formation. Yeah. Um, so whatever we are experiencing on the inside, good or bad, uh, we don't really want to recognize that we feel it. Like, yeah, I feel great about kicking that child out of the way. So instead, I'm going to be like, oh, yeah. I feel terrible about that, just terrible. Secretly though, I deserved it, I wanted that cake. Um, but it's where we express the opposite of whatever it is that we're feeling. Uh, displacement is when we express a negative emotion, usually this is anger, but not always, um, in a setting that is res less risky rather than in the setting where it is deserved to be expressed. Uh, one of my favorite examples, um, when I was in high school, uh, my dad yelled at me for a good 10 minutes, and I mean yelling like red in the face, screaming and yelling, uh, for um, I had moved a pencil from the kitchen table to the dining room table. Now I ask you, 
was he really mad about me moving a pencil, like mad enough to be yelling at me for 10 minutes about this? No. Even at the time, I was like, huh, there is something else going on. I do not know what that is, but this is not about me. Um, <laughs> and so this is a very common thing. People get angry in a setting where they can't yell back. My boss did something that made me mad, but you know what? He could fire me if I yell at him. So instead, I'm going to go to Dunkin' Donuts and yell at the person behind the cash register. Yeah, because that's safe. They can't fight back with me uh, because the customer is always right. Yeah, which is also, sidebar, one of the reasons why we often see people treating um, people in these low-paying positions so terribly is because they're pissed off at other things, but they can't uh, yell. But in a situation where we have low-status uh, workers and the customer is always right and actually they'll get in trouble if they stand up for themselves people take it out in those situations because it's safer safer yeah so that that is our displacement right there um displacement moving down again is uh similar but not the same as sublimation so sublimation would be when we actively take one of these things that is um harming us one of our in unacceptable impulses and channel all that energy into something that would actually be helpful to us so oh i've had a really bad day i'm gonna go run and just run until I'm too tired to, to think it or let all of the energy out. Um, or I'm going to throw myself into my work because I can't deal with what's happening in my life. You know, these sorts of things, that would be sublimation, which is, again, kind of similar to displacement, just, but displacement is more like um, I'm, I'm venting in an unacceptable situation because it's safer for me, whereas sublimation is I'm going to try to channel this into something that is uh, better. All right, um, and then last but not least, we have our object relations theory. Uh, so the object in the object relations theory is a person. It's another person. If we're talking about a sentence, I am the subject, I am doing blah, 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 talking to blah, 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 etc. Uh, the object is the person that I am relating to. Yeah, the other person is the object. I am the, the subject. Uh, so the object relations theory contends that we interact with others based on scripts that we developed in early childhood, um, based on our earliest relationships. So we have very supportive, caring, nurturing environment, and we expect people are going to be nice and basically good to us. Uh, if we're in an environment where we constantly have to fight with others in order to get anything, think about a dinner table with lots of kids and everybody's grabbing as much food as possible because they know that the older siblings are going to eat it all if uh, allowed to, um, they're going to expect to always have this sort of competitiveness. Um, but we, the idea is that we expect from others throughout our entire lives what we're used to receiving. Uh, and so when we expect people to treat us badly, it's because we're used to being treated badly and we think that that's normal. When we expect others to treat us well, it's because we're used to being treated well and that's normal. Um, also, these things that we expect we're more likely to do as well. Um, so if I expect that everyone is fair, I'm more likely to play fair. If I expect everyone's going to play dirty, yeah, maybe I'm going to play dirty, yeah? Um, this can also, the object relations theory, sometimes we are the object as well. So think about like that internal monologue that people sometimes have, that, that inner judgmental voice, you can't really do this, who do you think you are? You, you suck at this, blah, blah, blah. We have become the object in this script. We expect everybody else is being judgmental of us, and so we, our interior voice becomes judgmental of ourselves. I put in some uh, notes here. Uh, I have heard this called, my friends call it the lizard voices, that hissing, ah, oh, you suck, you're so bad, that kind of, that, that internal monologue of, of judgment and error and whatever else. Um, also, Jay Smooth, who's an online dude, he has radio shows out. Anyways, I, I adore him, and he talks about the little haters, which again, that inner judgmental monologue uh, that is based once more on what we expect other people are thinking about us. So finally, for the object relations theory, 
uh, relate this to your character. Um, once again, uh, as you're going through and kind of finalizing this to upload it into Blackboard, into the discussion board, uh, I want you to have something from each of these. I am going to grade it. Um, again, it does not have to be serious. You can make it as ridiculous as you want, but it does have to be accurate. I want you to be accurately using the terminology and at any example that you provide, I want it to, to make sense. Yeah. Um, and yeah, have fun with it. Have fun with it. It'll be it'll be good. If you can't think of a way that any one of these particular things relates to your character, you can switch to another character. Don't just leave it blank or say this doesn't work for my character. Give me something. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving forward real quick to our next time in Psych 100. We have spring break next week, and once again this assignment is going to be due on Blackboard by our April 4th class. So by that Monday at start of class you need to have uploaded this uh, into the discussion board. In class in two weeks we are going to be reading Social Cognition and Attitudes and Prejudice, Discrimination, and Stereotyping. These two chapters are kickoff into social psychology. We're going to spend two weeks in social psychology. It's going to be really fun stuff. So uh, take notes on both of these chapters, and for your psych activity, I want you to go through a thought process, do a little thought experiment. Consider the phrase, you see from where you stand. I want you to think about this uh, literally, where your physical body is, but also um, kind of psychologically, culturally. The, the space, the social space that you occupy, the people that you are around, and the social status that you have. Um, think about this phrase, you see from where you stand, in terms of social cognition and stereotypes. And think to yourself, why and how might other people see things differently than you? and turn in your brief report. Let me know if you have any questions. I will see you in two weeks.